Shrikal, Ram Ram, Namaste Islam. I'm your host, Shasun and I'm your watching Jair to Channel. Today, once again, we are having our very own guest, Mr. Navtesh Mangadji. And we would be discussing topic Jad as a good race in Sapta Sindhu or in subcontinent. So, thank you very much, uh, Mangad brother, for giving your precious time. So, uh, first of all, I'll ask you, do you not think that nowadays West and rest of the world see India and Pakistan uh, in terms of religion rather looking or gauging through genetically to subcontinent? Yes, uh, I think you're right. I think the divisions are purely geopolitical, but they're not necessarily ethnic and cultural. Uh, we think of, and similarly, it's not just in Pakistan and India, it's the whole of region, Afghanistan, Iran. We have to remember, these are very recent names. They were given in modern contemporary times. In ancient times, there was no Afghanistan. There was no Pakistan, obviously India. There was no Iran. So uh, I think it's part of uh, the, the, the conceptualization of India and Pakistan it's part of the same misconception in, uh, which really embraces the whole of that entire region uh, and in, indeed many, many other regions. We don't look at the ethnic, you're right, and cultural similarities. And if I would ask you, who are the true sons of soils of, of that region? Who are the native of that region? Are Jats well, the native of that region? Yes, I, definitely the Jat community, because you see, we have a history that is continuous, unbroken, uninterrupted. And, you know, if I may say, Asan Bayou, it goes back millennia, not centuries. If you go back to the earliest times in history, you have people whose names phonetically, etymologically, in terms of every other respect, are identical to us. I, the Gutians, G-U-T-I-A-N-S who fought the Sumerians, then, yes, obviously you have the, the Masagetai, you have the Jutes, you have all these other communities that spread out from Central Asia. And this is the point. When I mean Central Asia, who've been in this region of Iran, Pakistan, what is today Pakistan, Northern India, Afghanistan for millennia. And it's supported by the archaeology. If you go back in history, we have forts with inscriptions with references made to the rulers who were all judged by their name, as you know, Randava, your Bajwa, Kang, Man. It's totally unambiguous. So from that perspective, in so far as we, the Jats, have a continuous, un uninterrupted, unbroken history, archaeologically, architecturally, historically, ethnically, semantically, in every other way, yes, we are the sons of the soil. So, and one more question. Uh, there's a very famous slogan of Indian Army, Jartu ka itahas, Bharat ka itahas hai. Means, uh, Jart's history is the history of India. Without Jart, there is no history of India. What is your point of view about that one? Yes, absolutely. Because, <clears throat> you see, look at ancient history. Who established the first kingdoms and empires in India? And by the way, that not only defended its boundaries, that extended it, that also propagated certain beliefs, certain philosophies, Buddhism. So I'll give you an example. For example, Vikram Ditya, King Vikram Ditya. Vikram Ditya is a corruption of Virk. As we know, Virks are Jats. Vikram Ditya, now according to archaeologists and uh, historians, they believe he ruled a vast empire, which was most of northern India down to central India, what is today Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Central Asia. It was the biggest empire of its time. Then forget Vikram Ditya. We come uh, further in time to the likes of uh, Yashodharma, King Yashodharma, who defeated the Huns. Uh, his victory celebrated in Madhya Pradesh, in Mansur, in the pillar, where it states that the Jats, in, in Sanskrit, the Jats defeated the Huns. And it refers to Oluks, and it refi refers to uh, um, the Virk clan and other clans, indistinguishably Jats. Then also we have a Bud, Lord Bud, you know, who the founder of Buddhism, one time the world's most widespread religion. Uh, what? Who was Bud? Bud was a, a Sakya. Sakyas were Jats, like Sakas. His relatives were Mals, who are Jats, even to this day. Then we have the Mauryas, Ashok, Ch the Mauryan Empire, founded by Chandragupta. We know Mauryas are Jats. They're still Maurya Jats to this day. So yes, when you look at the history, 
we played a very important and essential role in establishing empires in India, kingdoms in India. In, and also with that, the advances, science, technology, education, language, religion. Let's not forget, the first universities in India were not Vikramshil, were not uh, um, um, Nalanda in Bihar. It was Taxila. And indeed, Mr. Um, uh, Asan Bajwa, who's a great scholar in Pakistan, has done many, many videos and done much research on this. Taxila was founded in 600 BC at the very time that area was ruled by Jat clans, as we know again from the archaeology, we know from the history and the records. So yes, Jat history is essential and integral part of our, our, our entire history. Even if you come down to the most recent times, who defended India's boundaries and borders and closed the Khyber Pass and the Bolan Pass for the first time in a millennia, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who subdued and defeated the Afghans and conquered parts of their kingdom. So there's so many examples that we, we can draw upon. For even if you if you take, for example, Suraj Mal, Gokula, Chulaman in, uh, in, in, in uh, northern India, uh, who, who established huge empires. So, um, and, and by the way, it extends further. We know that Tukluk, founder of the Tukluk dynasty, was a Jat because he was a, a he, uh, he was a Jat, a uh, half Jat, or actually he was Jat, not half Jat. We know that Rampur, the founder of the Rampur kingdom was a Jat, uh, adopted by Afghan, but he was a Jat boy. We know that Haider Ali, Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan were Jats. They originated from the village in Punjab, they were Jats. So this is all proven by solid facts, not circumstantial evidence, hard, irrefutable evidence proved beyond a reasonable doubt. So Jat history and Indian history is so intertwined. So you firmly believe that the Jats history is the history of India. But the th yes, it's right. The Jats created the ancient religions like uh, Vedic and Buddhism. But nowadays, world and even in India, people see it without Jats because they might be afraid of our race. So what is your point of view in this regard? Yes, very good point. You see, because we are a race. We are a distinct race. We are the step migratory people race. That means our origins go back to Central Asia. Southern Europe, many, many thousands of years ago, who then settled in India and uh, formed the longest continuous unbroken culture even in India. And the, the proof of the pudding is in uh, DNA, in pure DNA and genetics. And as we know, science uh, with blood uh, doesn't lie, if, in the sense that science uh, can, can prove beyond a reasonable doubt and no better way than through DNA. And that has shown that only the Jat community in India have this R1A gene. That's the same gene that's found in Western Europeans, Northern Europeans, Germans, Scandinavians. I, ironically, the same people as us. It's not found to, to such percentile in any other community in India, not even the Brahmins. So in other words, we have more in common racially by way of our DNA with Germans, with Swedes, with Northern or Western Europeans than any other Indian community has. In fact, every other Indian community uh, Brahmins, uh, Vaishyas, uh, uh, Banyas, uh, Raj, so-called Rajputs, Katris, they share more DNA in common with indigenous Dravidian, that is Elamite, pre-Aryan peoples, Australoid peoples, Afroid peoples within the Indian subcontinent. So we are a race, and that is why we've been ostracized, because other communities have recognized that. You see, we were never incorporated into the caste system. I must make this absolutely clear. We Jats were step migratory Aryan peoples. We were a distinct race. We didn't want to be incorporated to the caste system because we eschewed it. We regarded ourselves as superior to it. Because we did that, the so-called Brahmins who were Dasyus, the indigenous, in other words, Dravidian pre-Aryan race, they then subjugated, they rele relegated us to the lowest caste, so-called Shudras. Because what they were saying is, oh, if you don't accept our authority, then you won't be incorporated into the caste system. But we were saying we don't care because we're superior to you and all the others in the caste system. And that's the point. The caste system, the Varana, was based on uh, a system that incorporated the communities that lived in India, excluding the Jats. In other words, pre-Aryan, Dravidian and pre-Dravidian communities. And that's again proved by DNA. So we never felt a need to be in the caste system because we were outside it, we were superior to it. And the same analogy I'll give you is, like when the Persians invaded, India, or the Greeks, or the Mughals, or any of the other white communities, 
they were all, they were never incorporated into the caste system. They were outside because they were distinct races. They were militia. So for me, yes. so for me, that is the attitude of other communities towards us uh, jats. Uh, we're saying to them that you know we are, we are rulers, we are warriors, we are landowners. And we don't need to be part of your caste system because your caste system is alien to us. It's foreign to us. Someone within the caste system, a Brahmin or a Rajput or a Katri or a Panya, can never become a Jat because they can't move from one race to another. They can't go from being a Dravidian to an Aryan or a, a race or a Jat race. But it can work the other way. In other words, a Jat marrying outside the, his Jat Gotras, his race, can be relegated to the a Dravidian caste. So a Jat marrying uh, a Banya loses his Jat status. He becomes then incorporated, absorbed into that mainstream Dravidian caste system. And that's exactly what happened. If you look at many of the names in India, I'll give you an example. Verma, Dingra, Bhati, Bhatia, Uppal, uh, and there are many, many others among Katris, uh, and then Tomar among Rajputs. These were actually uh, people, people now, who are Khatri or Rajput, but whose ancestors were Jats, who had married outside the Jat system, had married outside their race. So the Jat community uh, rejected them. And because the Jat community rejected them, they took the past status, the Varna, of the, the, the people they married, the, the, the girls, whatever they, uh, boys, whatever they, they married into. So that is why today you'll have a lot of so-called Rajputs, Katris, and others who use surnames that are identical to us. It's because actually they're bastardized Jats, to put it very bluntly. Same, the same example would be like when an Englishman married an Indian. He be, the progeny became Chichi. The English community didn't accept them, and the Indian community didn't accept them. And there are many, many other examples of life. If you take, for example, in the Americas when whites married black slaves, they produced children, but those children were never regarded as white. So similarly, when a girl or a boy from our Jat community married outside the Jat community, they they tarnished our race. They lost that racial, um, how do you say, homogeneity. And they became the, they, they became, belonged to the community to which they married. And right now, Jats are still contributing at two sides of the same land, India and Pakistan, in the field of military, athletics, sports. So you must have heard many of them in recent times, like Daya Singh Randhawa, General Oh, there's so many. General yeah. Javed, yes, General, retired General Kamar Javed, Bajba, Hina, Sidhu, and many more. So Absolutely. So do, do you not think that their pure and good genetics make them distinguished by others? Absolutely, 100%. I'll give you a perfect example. The British, and it's in the Gazette, the British published in the Gazette in, uh, throughout the years that they ruled India, statistics on many, many subjects, anthropology, archaeology within India, race, history, culture. So one of them was when they did a measurement of races and they took the average heights overall and they took the stature and the Jats were right at the top. And the British recorded that there were many Jats who were scaled 193 centimeters in height. In fact, the... Um, um, the, the president's bodyguard in India, which was the viceroy's bodyguard, two thirds are Jat because of the height, superior height and stature. And I should add this thing, that along with the first, second uh, Patiala battalions were the tallest soldiers in the British empire, tallest. And you see old pictures of the old Jats when they are measured against their white contemporaries or officers or peers, the whites are nothing, in, or the English are nothing in, in terms of height comparison. So you have definitely those are the statistics. I mean, look at sports. Look, look, like, look at the Buller brothers in America, uh, Jack Buller brothers. They're the tallest professional uh, NBA basketball brothers. One is seven foot six, one is seven foot three. Look at the Chima brothers in basketball in India. All of them, you know, like six and a half feet to seven feet. Uh, there are many, many cases. If you look at our uh, Shioran, S-H-E-O-R-A-N, heavyweight boxing champion of India. You look at Guman, the bodybuilder. You look at uh, Parminder Singh Nagra, the heavyweight boxer. These are all huge guys in terms of height and stature. And you look at um, Jinder Mahal, who's actually a Dillon, Jat, who's a WWE world champion, six foot six. Arjun Bulla, one-time uh, uh, MMA, USC champion. 
uh, good, you know, all these uh, individuals. And I can cite many, many examples. You talk of accomplishment. Let's not forget Asian Games, Commonwealth Games. Uh, who has won the most tally of gold medals? Who? Just in the last games that we had, major games, 40%, well, no, more than that. I think 60%, 70% of the medals were won by Jats, if not more. And this is all in Quora and my writings. It can all be verified by the facts that I've researched. So um, and let me mention one other thing. Who was the, one of the greatest sportsmen India's ever produced? People forget. Dosanj, the hockey player. He's the only Indian to have won three gold medals. Even Chopra, Neeraj Chopra, who's also incidentally a roar uh, who won the gold in Javelin at the last Olympics, has won gold. Dosanj won three. And with him as a player in the Indian uh, national international hockey team, India won six times, six times in the Olympics. Our genetics are stacked for us as a, as a good race in this world. But after partition, we are unable to marry and can't make marriage ties at both, si both sides of the same land owing to different faiths and religious following yes. and facing marriage crisis and still unable uh, to find out good matches to make good couples in order to preserve our genes and DNA. So how do you, do you think about this one? Yes, you see, it's a sad situation because it's something to which the governments of both Pakistan and India have contributed to very perniciously and, in, and, and, and intentionally. The reason being that, let's th face it, the breadbasket of India has always been the Northwest in the lands that were tilled and soiled by Jats, Jats who were renowned as being the best farmers. So the land was up for grabs, so to speak, when India was divided and Pakistan was created. So what better way than to alienate, ostracize Jats? So, for example, you had the partition, then you had the Land Sealing Act, then you had the further division of Punjab in uh, both in 1966, um, in which there were a lot of changes made to the boundaries. In that case, was the better. In fact, my grandfather, my dadaji, played an instrumental partner, Honorable Ennis Margaret QC, in helping to redraw Punjab's boundaries in 1966 in India. But then again, that was all reversed and changed in, in the 70s with, the again, the division of Punjab into Haryana and then Himachal. Now, why I mention this is it was also an attempt to destroy our language, Jatki and our local indigenous dialects. So uh, because uh, anywhere that was not a Hindu-speaking majority, it was divided and it was alienated. So there what you have a lot of Hindu, Hindi speaking people moving into our villages in Punjab in India and taking on Jat names. So, by the way, something which had been done for generations, even by Chamas and lower caste. They often took our Jat names because they knew that it was one way of advancing themselves. <laughs> That's one scenario which contributed to the dilution of our genes and our race, is where people coming into our boundaries, coming into our lands, uh, adopting our identities, adopting our names. Uh, the second is Yes, um, um, uh, racial miscegenation, where uh, the Jats have married outside their clan, they've married non-Jats, uh, their progeny still claiming to be Jats. Uh, that has also been a, a, another issue, and that could be largely because of shortage of suitable matches. Uh, so, yes, there has been a great problem in preserving our racial identity. You ask me what is the solution? The only solution is to have what other communities like us have, throughout the entire world, when I see other communities, communities that are unique by way of their culture, race, their customs, i.e. tribes, that is, have their own autonomous, self-ruling um, regions or governments or states, like the Kurds. Let's not forget the Kurds, who are also very linked to the Aryan peoples. They are spread in Syria, Turkey, um, uh, Iraq. But today, for the first time, they're having greater autonomy than they ever had before. There's a sense of their identity. So in areas of predominantly majority uh, uh, occupied uh, Kurdish areas, they, they do have clans that are organized for their protection and preservation. And I think there's no other way of preserving the Jat community because otherwise we as a race become like every other race in India. Please, I must give this as a caveat. We've preserved our race. No other community have race has preserved its integrity as we have for thousands of years. We're still called Jats. But if you go to America, sorry, if you go to Germany or Sweden or Norway or uh, England, you don't hear people saying, I'm a Jat or a Jute or a Goth because we're all the same race. The Jutes were the Jats. Jutes invaded southern England. We're Jats, same race as us. They stem from the same ancestors. 
uh, certainly the Angles and the Saxons, but they don't refer to themselves today as Angles or Saxons or Jutes. They just say I'm English or I'm French or I'm German or I'm Swedish or I'm Norwegian. But we still say we're Jat, whether we're in Pakistan, whether we're in India, maybe whether we're in Afghanistan or in Iran. That is what's remarkable. That proves all the more that we've always identified ourselves as a race and not bound, I must emphasize, not bound by any artificial modern 19th, 20th century colonial geopolitical boundaries and borders. Same is true of the Kurds. Same is true of the Kurds. And let's not forget that when Maharaj Dalip Singh was being sent to England, uh, William Henry Sleeman advised his 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 uh, his guardian, said, take him to Kent and Sussex, to the land of his people, the Jats, the Jats of England. So that says it all. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we are unique and uh, we retain that uniqueness. Why lose it now after thousand years, thousands of years of fighting to preserve it and fighting in such a manner as not just to protect ourselves, but protect everybody else. Saying, in other words, I'm a Jat and I'm proud and you are so-and-so and you should also be proud. That is very true. Our race is purely connected and known by clans. So how can we do good clans management and organize our clans by, by considering uh, that our race is following different faiths and religions so that we could come together. Very good point. It, it, it does have a lot of obstacles. We have to get people from who recognize themselves as Jats first, first and foremost. We have that sense of identity in India. We have that sense of identity in Pakistan. I don't think it's emerging so much in Iran, Central Asia and Afghanistan. The names there like Sohis in Iran, but to some extent, religion has clouded their judgment, uh, as it has even in India, among Jats in India, Hindu Jats, who are very much clouded their judgment by BJP or even in Punjab by Sikhism. So one thing we have to do is overcome religion. Say to the people, first go for DNA testing. Check your DNA. Who and what are you? Your DNA tells everything about you. It says that you are of a certain race. The religion comes later. Your race has been around before any religion which was created and invented by man, came about. So we have to create that sense of pride, sense of superiority. Superiority in a sense that we still maintain that genetic makeup for thousands of years. Until we do that, we can't form any clans. So that means going to people all over the world with anthropologists and saying, well, look, who are you? What are you? Just test your DNA. Yes, look your DNA. It shows that you're the same as Mangad in India or um, Mr. Randawa in, in, in Scotland, who came from Pakistan, that you are the same racial identity. Then it's for them to make the choice. Is my race more important than my culture and my clan more important than my religion? And we need to have, like has been organized, international Jat parliaments that have been meeting in India uh, recently. I think you or one of your colleagues sent me uh, the congregation of Garaval clan and other clans that come every year and they congregate, they get together. That's probably one way to... Um, to escalate this. And I think as Mudasa Bajwa has said, one of our colleagues is we need to form these virtual villages and we need to form, uh, and the virtual villages can only be formed when we first identify I among our clans who is a pure Jat. So among Bajwas, among Randawas, among Mangas. So to form that sense of identity. And then from that sense of identity to have uh, a regular interaction and support ourselves economically. So that means if a Jat if there's a Jat lawyer, he engages a Jat doctor who engages a Jat architect or engineer. So we create that supply chain of services that economically support us, you know, reciprocally. And that's what a lot of other communities do. The Gujaratis do it, the Banyas do it, the Marwaris do it, the Kojas do it, Ismailis do it, Parsis do it. So why shouldn't and can't we do it? We're educated enough. There are plenty of Jats who are the top of science, professions, business, academia. That's a good idea. I'm going to ask the last question. So right now, if you look in India, uh, there's a big problem regarding Khalistan. So what do you think? Who is supporting to Khalistan? I think Jats don't support to Khalistan, but who is behind of behind of the behind of the story? Who is supporting to Khalistan right now? Are Jats right. supporting well, to Khalistan? You, reason being, when we had the Jat farmers protests. It was all around simply one thing, which was economic survival. If you look at all the Jat farmers who rallied in Delhi, they had nothing to do with the Khalistan, nothing. Many of them were very affluent, educated, owning hundreds or thousands of acres, but came there to protest at these arbitrary laws. And did you ever see Khalistani flags being flown by the Jat farmers in Delhi? 
or mm-hmm. Haryana, UP. Nonsense. No, you didn't. No. Pakistanis no. used it as a pretext to basically propagate their own cause, to say, oh, look, these are farmers, these are Sikhs, these farmers are Sikhs, and they're protesting against the government, so they must be pro Khalistani. That's absolute nonsense. And who is supporting Khalistan? I'll tell you who's supporting Khalistan. They are non jats The most, uh, if you want to say, ignominious of them is Gopal Singh Chavla. Gopal Singh Chavala is currently residing in Pakistan, protected by the IS, the Pakistan Secret Intelligence Service, and who is spreading hatred in India, propagating terrorism in India and abroad, and to the point that he might even have been involved in the murder of uh, Suri, a Mr. Suri, a Shiv Sena leader in India, because when uh, Mr. Suri was assassinated or murdered some months ago, Mr. Gopal Singh Chavala was rejoicing from Pakistan. Then we have Mr. Babbar, B-H-A-B-W-B-R, another Khalistan. We have Chavala. We have Dugal. When you look at, uh, the, for example, the Air India uh, 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 crash, uh, sorry, the terrorist attack, uh, India, India play was destroyed in the 80s. That was masterminded all by a ring of uh, 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 Qatri Sikhs. And one has to understand the basis for that. It's the Qatri Sikhs who are propagating this litany. Of, of total nonsense, because they're the ones who dominate the Gurdwaras. They're the ones who are interpreting to the masses, to the public. They're the ones who need to maintain their hegemony within within Sikhism, because of maybe the gurus that they associate with who are being Qatris. So um, when you talk about Jats, they may be, yes, of course, we can't, uh, we can't rule out the fact that there are silly Jats out there. But as a majority, we do not identify with Khalistan. And the leaders of Khalistan are certainly not identifiable as judges, but predominantly, as I've given the example, Qatris. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mangat brother, for, for giving your precious time and you share your very good, valuable inputs uh, for this program. Thank and you. we would be doing next program with you on different topics. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.